This conference will now be recorded. Okay, gotcha. The Lewis and Clark Olney Woluski Citizens Advisory Committee meeting on uh, this lovely day of December 3rd, 2020. This is a call to order. And uh, let's do some introductions. My name is Mike Magyar. I'm the chair. I live at 36494 Battle Creek Lane in Astoria. And uh, let's see, uh, we don't, let's just go down the list here. Who's next? Uh, Jim Nikas. I'm here somewhere. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jim. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, 34755 Highway 101 Business. Gail Henriksen, Class of County Community Development Director. Julia Decker, Class of County Planning Manager. Carol, do you want to uh, introduce yourself or not? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Okay. Well, um, let's do a review of the October 19th, 2020 meeting summary. I guess it's deferred to the next meeting. Let's, I'm assuming that's this meeting. Well, it's deferred to um, a meeting in, um, I'm going to assume is January, because uh, I didn't have time to get them done. Okay. So, so we're going to take the October minutes and the November minutes and hopefully have two sets of summaries for you in January. Sounds great. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a chance for those members of the public to, uh, to comment, voice their opinion on the stuff that we're doing here. I'm guessing, Carol, if you would like to offer a comment here, I'll mute myself. Okay, no comment from the general public. Uh, let's move down the task list to a review of the goal five topics. And uh, I'm gonna turn this over to staff for the fish and wildlife areas and habitats comments. Well, staff prepared some materials for you. Um, and uh, so we actually had um, the fish and wildlife areas and habitat um, materials, some of it um, staff prepared and some of it uh, staff just really basically took from um, some of the chapters from the uh, state um, and some description about how the um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife works with um, Chapter 635 of the uh, Oregon Administrative Rules and Division uh, and um, so anyway, it, that section applies to a lot of things. The, the topics range from tax incentives and fishing seasons and his, fishery management, hatchery, hatchery management, sorry. Grandson was up all night last night. I'm really tired. Um, he's teething, he's eight months old. Um, to enhancement programs, wildlife rehabil rehabilitation, um, conservation programs, all kinds of things. So we described some of that for you. Um, we provided um, some sections that described in a little bit more detail how that works. Um, also some um, information about conservation strategies for the coast range and the near shore areas. Um, and let's see. Also managed to bring for you a um, link to the Oregon Fish Habitat Distribution and Barrier Barriers Interactive Map, which is on the ODFW website, um, which is actually pretty cool. And so if anybody wants to try that out and use it, it um, allows you to take a look at where the barriers are to certain fish passages as well as um, what fish are found in which streams and um, how the fish use the streams if they know sometimes they don't um, so that's actually uh, it, it tells you where um, essential habitat is or if it's not essential habitat um, so that actually was 
kind of an interesting um, way for me to spend a couple of hours while I, I worked on what Clatsop County um, has in the way of, of wildlife and fisheries. Um, and so when we turn that on, sometimes we see quite a quite a web of information there. Um, so basically, um, with that, we had just wanted to focus, I guess, really, with, we have, with that background information, we really wanted to focus on the existing policies and um, take a look at if there are any things in those existing policies that you would like to discuss or if there's anything in there that you think is um, okay the way it is. Um, do you want to make any new policies? Do you want to just adopt the ones that are there? Um, staff had some recommendations in a few places. But um, I'm looking at policy one. I think Gail has it up there. Policy one um, A is completed. It um, designate the majority of um, the county timberlands um, as F80. That's done. Um, and policy B and C and D refer to zones that don't exist anymore. Um, so current standards require review for conflicts with major and peripheral big game habitat for conditional uses, um, clustering of structures and dwellings and, and things like that. Staff was going to recommend to delete A um, and the references to F38 and AF. Um, and so you're going to find throughout then this section on the policies that staff is mostly going to be recommending uh, removing those uh, obsolete zones. And um, Anyway, just taking a look at it, do you have things that you want to address? Um, when you get to policy three, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention, but um, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And Mike, you're muted. Let, let, me, um, let me just get to that particular page in the document here. One moment, please. Okay, so you wanted me to look at pol policy three or, or policies, uh, talk about policy one right now? You're muted, Julia. And now Did I'm you? doing it, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> It's so easy to do. Um, what I was hoping for you to do is take a look because there's a lot here. There is. And, there um, is. you know, to just maybe take the low hanging fruit first and say, hey, I'm not concerned about um, policy this, 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 or this. These are the ones I'd like to talk about. These others I'm okay with. Or staff recommendations are all wet. I want to, you know, do a deep dive. Um, just, but I would start with, you know, are there any here that are okay as is or that are easy to deal with? I do those first. I I think obviously B and C need to be eliminated because they don't exist anymore. So that's pretty much a no-brainer. Yeah, and, and also E um or I mean, are we just assuming that you can remove F38 and AF20 from E and just leave it as F80? Is that is that how that sentence would read then? Submit all proposed plan and zone changes of land zoned F80 uh, to a more intensive use zone um, to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife for determination of possible conflicts with big game habitat requirements. Uh, that's that's pretty much standard operating procedure now. Okay. All right. Sounds all right. good. Um, I mean, I think a uh, policy one A through E. I I'd agree with Jim's assessment. B and C looks good addressing the the outdated language for sure. Um, all those look look good to me. I mean, I'm no fish and wildlife person, so it's it's definitely very very low. I don't even hunt or fish. I'm an urban guy who's trapped in Clatsop County, so that's me. So I'm pretty happy with uh, anything that if any, if everybody else thinks it's pretty darn good, I'm pretty happy with it myself. So. Uh, that's where the locals come in, you know. That's where people who are from here would have an excellent uh, point of view. Jim, are you a hunter and a fisher? Uh, not really. Really? 
Okay. No, ne never have. Takes too much time, and I don't have an attention span long enough to finish. So. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, are people generally, are your friends happy with the way that, uh, you know, the tags are set up for people with big, in the big game ranges and stuff like that? I mean, other than the fact that they don't always get the ones they want, but does that process work? Yeah, that, everybody I know is good with it. That's what, that's what I find too. Um, is the, is the, are, are the, uh, ODF guys, are they like harassing people on the rivers for do, you know, doing whatever they do? Are they, is everything working all right? Are, are they able to manage the hoo-hahs that come out here from the city and muck up all the little cricks and stuff? Is everything working all right? From a policing standpoint, I don't really know if any of this has to do with policing. Uh. I, not not so much. No, we're we're looking at um, okay. I see here land yeah. land use um, regulations. So policies that have to do with land use. So um, yeah. it it really has more to do with. Um, I mean, I think policy yeah. one is probably a good example of just clean up some language. Um, yeah. So if there were others, I mean. Fish and Game and um, Oregon Department of Forestry, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they all have their own procedures. Um, so we're, we're really looking at, at how this supports um, land use or how land use supports this. Um, I mean, I, I like uh, what I read in policy too. I think it looks good to me. I mean, it sounds reasonable. That's what I would do if I would be doing that kind of thing. Policy three. Jim, you have any comments on policy two? No, I, I agree. Looks good. What do you think about three? I mean, we're talking about protecting riparian vegetation on streams and lakes. Is does this impact us as uh, land development um, barons in this kind of thing? Are we are we being impacted by this kind of stuff? I mean, it sounds about right. We should be protecting these areas, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean it's it's been an ongoing. It's pretty much the way it's been. And, and yeah, it's by statute anyway, so there's no. It is exactly. So this was the one where I was thinking that we might take a look um, at one of the attachments, um, which was an email sent to me by Mike Sinnott, who's an ODFW um, assistant biologist. Okay. And what Mike was suggesting is that we. Um, consider adopting um, protection ordinances or, or making it at this case a policy that we should um, consider adopting protection ordinances that line up with the Forest Practices Act um, and I think Gail is looking for it here in this document. Don't we, don't we pretty much have that already? What well no our language is really vague and it gives us fits all the time. Um, it's really not um, helpful to us. We have language that says over here you've got a 35 foot setback to a line of non aquatic vegetation, but it doesn't define that very well. And then we have 50 foot setbacks over here, and we've got a riparian setback over there. And um, anyway, we, I'm sorry, go ahead. The only, the, only, the only question is on that, I, especially in residential zones, obviously, you know, there's so many residences and, and stuff out there that are, you know, maintaining yards right up to to waterways. And I don't, I don't know how you're going to enforce something like that that's been a long-term policy, but I don't know. It's just a lot. <laughs> It looks like the um, material that I was providing from Mr. Senna didn't get included in this, and I apologize. Um, basically, what he was offering was to help the county uh, determine, oh, there it is, Gail's got it, um, determine stream size and then setbacks 
based on the stream size and whether it's fish bearing or non-fish bearing. And he said that the department could actually help um, determine that for the county. We could adopt that. And that would line up with the Forest Practices Act and um, that we could use that then countywide and not go through um, this business of trying to make sure we apply it consistently without having strong language that helps direct staff with exactly where we're supposed to go. So anyway, Mr. Senate had suggested that staff was um, recommending that, but I'd like to take a look and uh, see what you guys think. Um, I, yeah, again, uh, how are you going to enforce or what kind of measures are you going to use for existing residential and farmland and how about our, uh, you know, our boat launches and parks and stuff like that. We're going to have truly have a 50 foot setback. Is that a, is that a, just a no build zone or is that, a, you're not supposed to touch it? Conditional yeah. use? It would, yeah, it would be handled pretty much the same way it is now. It was just, just be a matter of mostly identifying it. Uh, right. We don't have good ways to identify um, streams and creeks and and we just we need to clean up the language um, existing structures would um, be considered con non-conforming uses but they would if they were built legally then they'd be legal non-conforming uses so you know that would well, be fine. I, like i say my only concern is you know mowing of yards clearing the brush uh doing a lot of that stuff where the forest practices well i guess that's not true. You can take 50% of, uh, of of your trees in a in a setback. So, I yeah okay. I don't I don't know how you. I guess just a general thing would probably go, or just say that a copy force practice setbacks. I don't. Well, uh, my question, I, I like the idea, of course, of, of defining things. It's It's got to start with that. Uh, looking at this stream size chart here, all the way on the right and the bottom, um, are we saying that a non-fish bearing stream is 20 feet wide on average? Or is that the riparian zone that's 20 feet wide? That That would be the setback. Well, it's a setback. How do you know what the what's a what's a small stream? Well, the um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has a way of measuring it using um, water flow, stream flow, and size and volume. Um, so I see. they have a formula. That's, okay. That's what Mike is um, suggesting helping us with, so that we could then apply that and have it so that we know for every single one we'd know this is non-fish bearing, this is fish bearing. Um, and so we'd have that information, we'd be able to define it and just apply it evenly and consistently and fairly. I think um, that's great. If you can if you can catalog and map those streams and if you can put gauges in there or have technicians go out and map them and over the course of several years, you've mapped out most of this, the streams and somebody wants to pay someone to go troop through the woods and do that. And then you have an overlay of your 20 feet, 70 feet and so on. Uh, I think that's fantastic. I think from, from a planning perspective, it's it's super useful. Well, oh. that um, that map that we, you were looking at just a few moments ago from the Oregon yes. Department of Fish and Wildlife's website, yes. it's all there. Yeah. They've done it. They've oh, been, they okay. Been, and I didn't realize there were setbacks uh, in there. I thought it was just hi highlighted at, at scale. No, no, there's not setbacks in there, but it tells you what the fish bearing um, streams are and um, it tells you what, what fish are in there. So they've already identified um, a lot of what we're already talking about. Um, they've, they've already got the information. So then it's just a matter of cataloging um, like the non-fish bearing ones and especially the smaller ones. So I see. I see. So uh, a lot of this a lot of this work is is done. It's just we're not using it. We don't have it in our language in our code. Okay. Uh, I got one question like on sloughs, tight gated sloughs and stuff like in Jeffers Gardens that we have yeah. 35, 50 foot setback. Um, what are those classified? They're non fish bearing and they're not there. I mean, they're, they are drainage water, waterways, but they're what are the setbacks 
going to be or supposed to be on those because now they're at 35 and 50. Right, so those are actually part of the shoreland overlay, and that's actually covered in a different section of code. Um, so I would imagine that that would stay the same um, unless there's some reason that it shouldn't. Um, I, don't, I don't want it to be, that's why. I'm sorry, what? I don't want it to be, that's why. You don't that's want it to be. That's the reason. Are, are we assuming that the setback is uh, from the mean high water? I do um, not know. Um, well, mean, mean, high, mean high water is a different thing in the slough than it is in a, a normal waterway, a tidally influenced waterway. And I, rivers and creeks don't have mean high waterways. They have floods and, and stuff like that. But they're, you know, they don't have it. So I don't know. I don't know how you do that. Well, I think that you're going to find, I mean, what this really applies to here is we're talking about areas that are farther up and away where we end up with um, even non uh, year round small streams that end up being affected by um, logging or um, spraying or something like that because they feed into and it just keeps getting larger and larger um, tributaries all the way down and so we have sedimentation so part of what ODFW is trying to do is protect those and so that's where you're seeing um, these kinds of uh, recommendations but the sloughs in Jeffers Garden and uh, Miles Crossing those are going to be covered under goals 16 and 17 and I think that we have some of that further down in here. Well, the the process that you're in right now will actually address goals 16 and 17 later in the year specifically. But I think we probably have some language um, at the toward the end of this table if you want to take a look at it. Um, but this actually, I mean, they're 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 different animals, I guess I should say. But I was just going to look at the end of table one here and see if goal 16, 17 are in there. Yeah, so I'm goals. Gonna... Yeah, it's, oh, go ahead. Well, it's showing up on about page 14 is goal 16, estuarine resources. So this is where you're going to end up with your shoreland overlay um, policies. Just as a, a point of comment, um, you all are aware of the fires that ravaged the Mackenzie River uh, oh, yeah. east of Eugene. Um, it, at this point, so many structures were burned and uh, maybe a lot of those structures were just sort of built haphazardly. You can, I mean, I can't imagine that that would be the case, of course, in the Mackenzie River, but uh, sure enough, um, for people to receive fire uh, insurance, they have to measure the mean high water of the Mackenzie River and then um, prove that their structure is um, is not in the uh, the buffer. And in a lot of these cases, e e these older structures were built too close, and the foundation is there, and there really isn't any further upland for a lot of these people to build, and so they're being literally shut out of their houses right now. So I don't, I don't know how that plays out in this county yet because we're still kind of wet. We're not as dry as, but um, I'm wondering whether uh, if you kind of show these overlays, you see that it snags a couple of houses and uh, it's just something I was thinking about. It seemed like a horrible situation from what I've heard, but um, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with anything. It just came to my mind. <laughs> Um, what, let's get back to this here. What what can we what can we do to move uh, past this little sheet right here? Do we just say yes? Let's um, accept the recommendations from uh, the ODF, uh, Mike Sinat. Or we agree with them, or we think they should pursue that further. Um, 
this is what it, it's really what we're looking for is advice from you um do you think that having something consistent um with the forest practices act that applies in other zones besides the industrial forest lands um do you think that that makes sense um it could make sense if um if we can apply it to those zones. I mean, if, if are you saying that this document that we're looking at here was created mostly for the forest practice zones? And if so, would he do things differently if he was dealing with regular people? I guess that's the point that I was making earlier is like what happens when humans are impacted by this and not just logging, you know, commercial logging, industrial logging. Well, he what he was recommending is um, riparian buffers for protection it doesn't mean that people couldn't get a variance for example if they absolutely positively could not get use of the land without getting a variance if they had no reasonable use of the land uh, without getting um, you know within the stream buffer or something like that but in general it would um, keep people farther away from streams um, in some cases it'd be about the same but it, it applies something that's consistent over um, over over all the zones. My my concern on the thing again is is in especially a lot of records and stuff that are limited in space that probably a frontage of streams and creeks and stuff like that where you're gonna virtually eliminate them from having any development on them at all. And that's, of course, always a concern to me. Um, yes. And anyway, that's the only, that's the only red flag that this really throws up, just having a blanket 50, 80, or 60. Okay. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with Jim, and not not so much in that I'm I'm hell bent on destroying stream beds. I just don't know enough about it. Um, I I tend to leave it to the experts. Uh, if they, you know, I, I get it that biologists say that the riparian zones are critical to protect habitat, and I I would tend to agree with them on that. Um, but if you're talking about simple county variances to sort of get around these kinds of things and certain conditional uses I, i'm okay with that process too okay so and and understanding that right now you've got 50 foot riparian buffers um that apply to any fish bearing stream and you've got 35 foot um buffers to the line of non-aquatic vegetation so that's already in place and that's yes. that's already across every zone so okay. Um, but the difference between 50 and 100 is a, about double. Oh, yeah. So that, that's what my concern is. And like I'm saying, a lot of records. So when you have a setback, if you have a 200 foot lot, that's a lot of record that's in the uh, RA zone. Well, right. once you get all your setbacks, you have nothing to do with your property. That's, that's my concern. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I can think of at least a, a several projects right now that are kind of nestled into these sloughs, you know, I mean, everybody's trying to develop the low, you know, the the crappy projects right now, and, and it's just brutal to see the setbacks from sloughs. And uh, uh, hold on, I'm going to have to check out. Uh, I'm going to turn my mic off. Okay, we've got too many Bluetooth devices in the house that are fighting each other in a battle to the death. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you fine. Thank you. So I think in the, in the smaller lots that are in the Jeffers Garden um, area, where we have lots of record that are um, sometimes quite small, although we can go to 7,500 square foot minimum lot size there too, um, I, I think you're going to find that is going to be more covered by goal 1617. Um, this is vegetation along class one streams and lakes, and we don't define this, the streams and lakes by classes at this point or class two. We, we don't do that. We don't have that in our, our record. Um, we say it over here in policy three, but, 
but we don't define it. So I would assume we would go to the state anyway. Um, did you want to do some sort of a partial thing where it maybe applies in the rural lands area? And that would be the RA1, RA2, RA5 zones um, and leave out the um, the K, the KSRCR and the RCR, which is Miles Crossing, and the ACRCR. Recom remind, uh, but but I'll remind you that the the 50 foot setback still applies anyway, uh, right, and that right. shoreland overlay still applies anyway. So that's that's a possibility. I just throw out there to you, but um, I, I like that option. I, I like that you're considering that, Julia. I think that's great. Yeah, because how how many how many subdivisions are there really in the in the county itself? I mean, I know Miles uh, Miles Crossing and uh, Jefferson Gardens are probably the bulk the bulk of the housing that's that's in the county. Is that is that correct? Or, we have a lot or what about Platte Plains? Platte of Plains as well. Oh yeah. And then what about all that? Uh, what about those lakes out there? Those still have setbacks, right? Yes. Um, some they have different types of setbacks depending upon what they are, and this is where we get into having to go look at a map and figure out each one individually. And so you've got lakes in Surf Pines, you've got Cullaby Lake, you've got um, some of these other lakes up and down the whole area, and we end up um, every single time going and looking at an ancient map that's over here, not far from me here in my office. Um, and the map is um, from the 1970s or so, um, and it's frayed and old, and so we end up uh, parsing through these things. So we're looking for something that, um, you know, it would help staff, but if, if it's not something that you want, if you want to leave the language the way that it is, um, we certainly can. We do not have um, authority over the Forest Practices Act. Um, it says over here that the county shall rely on strict enforcement of the Oregon Forest Practices Act to protect riparian vegetation along these streams and lakes, classes one and two. Um, and so we don't have authority over it. We're going to we're going to rely on the Forest Practices Act. That's the only thing that we could legally do. Um, Mike was just looking at you know being able to um, provide us with something that would help us with our definitions and consistency in areas where the Forest Practices Act does not currently apply. If you're not into it, then, you know, we can just decide not to do that and move on. Uh, like I said, I have a lot of heartburn about it, um, just for the simple fact, on, especially the small non-fish bearing creeks and stuff like that, where you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to utilize your properties um, for, you know, the fish bearing stuff, I, I, I'm probably a lot more sensitive to than the non-fish bearing stuff that gives you restrictions. Um, that's basically what I can say. Okay, so the Forest Practices Act that, um, uh, just one more thing I want to say about it, Mike, um, actually in that table that he, we were showing you, um, the small non-fish bearing streams, the, um, there it is. The setback is 20 feet. Right now, it'd be 50. Right. Yeah, I see so what you're saying. It. Yeah, I, I get that now. Um, I'm just going to, you know, Jim, what do you think about just going with the staff recommendations? I mean, in some senses, they're relaxing it, and I think that's reasonable. Yes. Yeah. And like I say, that was my biggest concern, and you're right. I, I didn't even realize that it's actually going to reduce the setback. So I, I say we go with with staff. I, I vote for going with staff recommendations on this one. Okay, I'm good. Okay. All right. It's like pulling teeth, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Te teething is really kind of a sore subject with me right at the moment. So you know, <laughs> Wesley was a little active last night. Uh, <laughs> So um, were there any others here? I mean, policy for is kind of um, protect riparian vegetation and not covered by the Forest Practices Act. The, the county shall require a setback for non-water dependent uses. Um, this again, um, 
was was Mike um, offering to bring the riparian protection ordinances um, into alignment with the Forest Practices Act. Um, if you're okay with that, um, or if you want to discuss it, one thing I do want to let you know is that there is actually a section that the part that you're looking at right now is um, the stuff that applies countywide. There is actually a section here toward the end of this table one that is very specific to the Lewis and Clark only Waluski um, group or planning area, pardon me. So if you don't want to spend a lot of time in this section, I would understand that. Um, other groups will be focusing on this too. And I certainly want you to have the opportunity to look at it, digest it. And if you think of some things later, for heaven's sakes, please let me know. But nobody is going to look at only Waluski except you guys. Mike, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to, for, for policy four, I'm going to go with the staff recommendations as well. I just, I think, I think I understand what you guys are trying to do here, and it makes sense to me. Jim, what do you think? Am I out on a limb? I, uh, I'll, I'll reluctantly agree. You can run me off the road if you don't like it. No, run no, me in one of those, those ditches. We have a person. We have another person. You have, have Lori Agelsoff. Just... Is that Agelsoff? Yes. As you all know, I'm anti-change, so. Okay, I think we've done enough, we'll move on. I agree. All right. Um, so were there any of the others um, that you wanted to take a look at? A lot of the rest of it had to do with um, Oh, where we have um, various policies that have to do with um, wildlife reserves and things like that. Um, and so staff provided you with some information about um, yeah. where the where those are. And um, I don't know if there's anything in there that trips you or um, causes you to want to take a look at it. We we provided as much information as we could. No, I, I scanned through it. It looks it looks pretty good. I wish I had my watershed buddy from the city of Seattle here. He'd oh. probably have some opinions, um, but uh, I don't. And so that's more in his wheelhouse than mine. Um, I mean, I think it looks great from from what I've read and and it sounds good. I'm kind of a tree hugger myself, so I'm happy to see more restrictions. I know Jim's not going to like that at all, but uh, that's well, sort of my, that's, my play. That's not entirely true. But, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. That I know. I know. I get it. If there's nothing else that you want to pull out from the main policies and goals that are countywide, are you ready to take a look at the stuff that is um, specific to the Lewis and Clark yes. only Waluski group? Yeah, let's yeah. let's move to that so we can have some comments on that. Okay, um, it's not super long. Okay. Um, but um, I think, yeah, there you go. Um, so this one is, um, I mean, the first one is just that's our current practice. We cooperate with governmental agencies. Um, Basically, what that means is if we're um, doing any kind of um, reviewing any kind of an application that will be in major or peripheral big game habitat, which, by the way, is 98% um, of the county um, th for anything that's right. type two and above. So those are your conditional uses and your template tests and anything like that. Um, then we do send notice to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, Oregon Department of Forestry, and for some things, uh, depends on um, what the what the code requires, it may also go to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So that's wow. that's current practice. Okay. So they have the opportunity to provide um, comment or to notify us of, um, you know, statutes or regulations that we may not be aware of. Um, 
or to recommend conditions. So that that's current practice. I'm a huge fan. Retain that. Okay. That's my opinion. I'm good with it. Okay. Um, policy two. Um, we talked about that. That's that um, table that we were talking about. Uh -huh. um, we actually have a, a table in here for you to make um, your recommendations on new policies. And so we actually had some language that we put in there. Again, that goes back to Mike Sinnott's recommendations. Yep. Um, yep. Policy three. Habitats of all species indicated as endangered, threatened, or vulnerable shall be preserved. Nesting sites of endangered bird species shall be protected and buffered from conflicting uses. Um, that's consistent with current practice and state and federal regulations. So uh, that's that's basically, the, that's the law. So we will, I, I don't think we even have a choice. I think we have to continue to follow that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds, let's just keep following the law. Okay. Um, let's see. Policy four is longer, um, but it really has to do with existing wildlife refuges, um, which are owned and leased um, by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, or the U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service. Is, is that um, that elk meadow? Is that what that, that is? Elk meadows, yes. Elk meadows is one. So you have the Jewel Wildlife Meadows. That's out in the LC Jewel Planning Area. Um, but you also have the Lewis and Clark Wildlife Refuge, which is in the Northeast Planning Area, and that's that um, that set of islands that's out in the in the Columbia River. That's actually a wildlife oh, yeah, yeah. refuge. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. We also have the Saddle Mountain State Natural Area. Um, so basically, we we do have a, a number of those um, types of areas. Anything that would be new. Um, Basically, this just spells out the procedure. Um, yeah. One thing that's um, kind of interesting is the only zone that permits wildlife refuges um, or management areas is the OPR zone. And what this says over here is um, that it shall be some sort of type um, four procedure. And in the OPR zone, which permits it, it's a type one. It means it's um, it's basically a a very simple type one development permit. It is not a type four procedure with all of the notification that goes with that. So anyway, I just throw this out to you um, if there's anything that needs to be updated here because obviously we're not following our code um, or our code isn't following our plan, but I guess my question is, does it need to? Do we just want to replace, or do you um, have some ideas about what you want to say here? Um, because as I said, the OPR zone allows these, the creation of these management areas as a type one, as a development permit. It'd be no different than putting a house in um, the RA1 zone um, and instead of a type four procedure, which is going to require hearings in front of the planning commission and then onto the board and notification to the, um, Department of Land Conservation right. and Development, and so um, do you want to do anything with this, or do you uh, want to direct staff to do anything? To I agree, I agree with you. I agree with that, and you should be able to do them in all the zones without there being a type four. Right? I think that's a good policy. Do you guys want to propose any language for this, or do you want staff to maybe come up with something to bring back to you, or? Yeah, I mean that that sounds like a, a a big a big deal to just discuss right here with language. I I don't know about you, Jim, but I'm not in a. This is this is the the worst year time of day for me to do anything except go to bed. I'm like uh, brain dead. So wordsmithing is I can't I can't commit. And but, I, I I agree. Staff should come up with something, and we can just yeah. See yeah, can you guys do something and then and then ship it over to us and I'll read it at four in the morning when I'm wide awake. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, no, I'm in bed at eight. I'm in bed at eight. Eight o'clock. Did you hear that? <laughs> if I could be home by then, yes, I would be. <laughs> I'm a partier, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm nine to three, so I'm I'm with you. <laughs> Yeah, 
yeah, no, that sounds great. I appreciate the language. I think that's very interesting. I'd like to know, is type four seems so extreme, but then there's some instances where it could be valuable. You know, it just seems like across the board doesn't sit well with me, but I haven't thought about it that deeply. Okay. Okay, we'll play Jim, with what it. What do you think? You think? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd still like. I say you should be able to to have an easy policy to set up wildlife refuges. You yeah. know, just language in there about some kind of public discussion over it. So, and you know, you know, obviously, certain people are going to have problems with something. Yeah, next yeah. yeah. I'm good with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be the one making those decisions, even though I'm sitting here. Well, what do you think about if um, it were a type two? Um, well, I mean, OPR, open space parks and recreation, that's really what it's designed for. But what if in other zones, it was a type two application that requires public notice, but doesn't require a hearing? And right. one thing that happens is if you have public notice and you get a lot of public comment, then the director yeah. has the ability to raise it to a 2A um, as appropriate and get it in front of the planning commission or and or the board. Um, that that if it, sounds if great. It, you know, if it if it comes up to to be something that does turn out to be controversial, but if it's not, then you know, people will receive the notice and go, oh, that's nice, and you know, hopefully just recycle it. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I, okay. I agree, Julia. That and it seems to me the way Clatsop County politics seem to work amongst the communities is nobody says a word until somebody tries to put a road through their backyard and then uh, everybody's on it. And that's great. And that's how it should be. Word gets out. Um, and maybe the same should be in this case here, where the, if it's a type two, um, at least all you get to do is just put notice out. Does that really impact your staff resources too much or is that normal? No, that's, um, I, 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 I think that actually is a, a I mean it, the other the other zones don't have refuges in them uh, so that's another question I guess I have for you is should a wildlife refuge um, be something that's permissible in another zone um, open space parks and recreation that's that's pretty much it's that's where it is um, do you want it in other areas do you want it in forestry do you want it in the AF zone I mean, I can definitely see it in EFU zones because of all the low EFU zones we got, but then that brings up the, you can't make any policies against farming, so I, I don't, don't know how that work. Hmm. That's something I have to think about a little bit deeper. Okay. Yeah, so this oh. is all the OPR zoning in the county. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. But almost all, all the rest of that is F80. Basically, OPR zones were created around the existing uses only, weren't they? I believe they were. There's no new, except for when you're downsizing in, in the plains, there's no new OPR zones that have been created, right? We have not, to my knowledge, had new OPR zoning Although I'm wondering if um, if there were density transfers, if that's a zone, yeah. I, and I don't know right off the top of my head if that's something that um, something that density is coming off of the. Yeah. Um, is it in that list, Jim? Do you yeah. remember? Yeah, they, it they, is. You know, like the ones the ones we did for Polo Ridge, they, they downsized a mine to two OPRs. So there is the potential to create new OPR zoning through density sure. transfers, for sure. example. Yeah. Okay. So, Julia, do you, wouldn't you think that ODFW would also have uh, a responsibility on their part that they probably already have their own requirements that uh, would trigger a uh, public meeting or at least some sort of public input gathering uh, in addition to anything that the county might do? I would, I would guess that they would send a notice, but I don't know if they would send it to us. Um, would they send it to neighbors? I don't, I don't know what their procedure would be. I haven't been through that.
Okay. Um, Jim, do you think we should beat up on this one anymore? Or can we move forward? No, no, I think I think we should just move forward from it. I think we pretty much understand each other what we feel. Okay. Okay. Awesome. What's next? Well, you can take a look at some of the other the other stuff that we have um, following this for the um, other goals and policies that kind of bring in wildlife habitat and um, fish and wildlife areas. They're in other sections, um, so they've got that gray shade on them. If there was anything yeah. in there that you wanted to take a look at, um, we can, but you know, it's not for now. It's just provided for your use. Um, at this time, if you're interested, but um, you don't, there's no action necessary um, because we're going to get to all of these things later. But if you okay. keep going through, then we've got another section to look at. And that is something that Ian provided for you because it was a section he was working on. And that's going to show up starting on about page 68 of your packet. Um, he's got a, a memo regarding um, federal wild and scenic rivers, um, state scenic waterways, um, Oregon, Oregon recreational trails, scenic views, and sites. Um, so yes. basically, he provided a little bit of background information there for you um, and was hoping for you to review the list of inventoried resources, um, see if there's anything that's missing or that should be added, um, review the policies, verify whether they should be removed, retained, or amended. Um, and so he did provide the the resource inventory here. Is there, um, yeah. got outstanding scenic view sites, um, Box Canyon, um, I don't think I've ever even been there. Um, I don't even know about that. Yeah, I, that I don't. That sounds cool. I know. I don't even. I don't know about it either. Um, so he's got a list there for you to take a look at, um, and then some policies for you to take a look at. Um, okay. And so I don't think it's a huge section of code. There's really only probably a half a dozen of policies to look at. Yeah, I mean, that, that all looks really great. I mean, th those are the policies. We should retain those policies for these scenic areas. Were there areas? I mean, you're looking at the list of the areas. Um, I'm looking at goal five. Yeah. Is that what goal I'm supposed five, to be looking at? Yeah, Goal 5 Resource Inventory, so Box Canyon, the Napa Gorge at Big Creek, um, Nat Creek Falls, Plimpton Creek Falls, Fall yes. Creek Falls, um, Young's River Falls, uh, most of these I'm familiar with, but Box Canyon I am not. Um, is there anything missing from this list? If there is, I'm not saying. <laughs> Jim? <laughs> I, I'm not saying either. <laughs> You're gonna keep it a secret. I own a couple of waterfalls, and I don't know that much to be on scenic areas. Does anybody know where Box Canyon is? Well, it's up by Crown Camp. It's okay. If, if you're familiar with uh, Ridge, uh, God, just past Crown Camp, and he's over there. Big gorge in the bridge. If you've ever been up on a logging road, maybe yeah, it's, uh, bridge eight or bridge seven. Anyway, you head out of camp and you head up about two miles up the road just before the Warrington's uh, water reservoir. There's a big uh, bridge and a canyon that you go over, and that's Box Canyon. I have never been there. It's really neat, especially if you hike into it. Cool. Okay. So is there anything here that should come out? I'm all for keeping Box Canyon, by the way. It sounds cool. I want to go there. 
Um, is there anything that should come out? Is there anything that should be amended? Is there anything that should be changed, not just on that inventory list, but um, in these policies? Right. Uh I, I think the list is great. Uh, if Ian's been doing his homework, he's done more homework than me. So I'm gonna assume that he's found the good stuff. And uh, I, I'll say that I think it looks great. Um, and I've been reviewing the goal five stuff. And I think the first, um, I, I like natural resource, uh, natural area policy, water resources and wilderness. I agree with all of those. I think we should retain this um, policy. Um, and I, I think the last one is interesting to me just because I think dredging is, is kind of interesting. Um, I'm, ass I'm assuming the Corps of Engineers knows what they're doing with that. So uh, uh, Jim, do you have any comment on the Corps of Engineers and their ability to keep these waterways open for us? No, I, I believe they're probably really good at that's that's what I'm guessing too. I mean, they're really restricted, so I guess that means good. Yeah. A lot, of science, a lot of science goes into any any dredging project. Yeah. Yeah, they seem they seem to keep the rivers open, so let's let's keep that one too. So I I agree with all those. Okay. Um, yep. And then Ian provided you with um, some other excerpts from other sections of code. Again, not something you need to address now. It's just there for background information. Um, we'll yep. be getting to it later, but it's um, it's just there for you to use uh, as you're thinking about these things. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, basically, you've made it through the materials that I was hoping for you to look at this evening. Um, so unless there's something that you want to go back to that um, you want to look at again, um, I do think I'd like to have you look at table three and I'm trying to remember where it is. Um, so table three for the um, scenic rivers, uh, state scenic waterways is on about page 75 of your packet. There it is. Okay. Um, and so staff recommendation of an issue to be addressed was a section of the Nehalem River within Clatsop County was designated as an Oregon Scenic Waterway in 2019. And um, staff was suggesting um, adding that to the um, to the comp plan of significant um, resources. Um, so basically putting that in that list that was up above. Um, and then the other one was the Oregon Coast Trail and Saddle Mountain Trail are also designated Oregon Recreation Trails, which are required to be designated as significant Goal 5 resources. Um, and they are both currently not included, and Ian is recommending um, to include them. And so if yep. you're on board with those things, any, yeah, so Mike, Mike's a yes. I'm, I'm good with it. And Jim's a yes, okay. So, um, Unless there was something else for you to look at in there, I think that's that's it. And then I wanted to just run back and look at that same goal three or uh, table three for um, the earlier section, and that is going to be on page 29. So you're back to your um, well, that says groundwater. The wrong thing. Make it in here. Yeah, it's the right table, just the wrong heading. I fixed wrong it. Wrong heading. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, the Oregon Solutions Elk or Clatsop Plains Elk Project. Actually, Gail right. is better to speak to that. Um, and uh, so, anyway, if you want to take a look at these real fast and see if there's anything, um, these these are things that staff found and was going to speak to. Um, Gail, do you want to talk about the um, elk project? I love the elk. I could talk about the elk all <laughs> night. What do you want to know about the elk? Um, so um, Oregon Solutions put together uh, a group of uh, jurisdictions, including Warrington, Gearhart, Seaside, uh, Classup County, and uh, several state agencies, ODFW, uh, ODF, and several private property owners, including uh, several of the large uh, timber 
owners and some private property owners and Oregon Hunting Hunters Association. And the goal of the project is to identify different tools that we can use across a broad spectrum uh, to reduce human and elk interaction. And one of the committees that was formed and created a set of tools was a land use committee because right now obviously we have a lot of development happen happening on the class of plains and that's uh, part of what's exacerbating the uh, interactions between elk and human. And so what we would like to do, we have a declaration of cooperation uh, coming up before the board for discussion on January 5th. That declaration would spell out the county's commitments to implement these tools, including the land use piece of it. Uh, so what we would like to do is get those uh, something in the comprehensive plan that would uh, solidify that commitment that the county is making through that declaration to review and amend its land use policies as needed, working in conjunction with the other cities. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes sense. I don't know if I feel great with that. Is that are you talking about restricting development because because of the elk uh, migrations or well, what? Well, that that would not be my recommendation. What the uh, declaration looks at, as recommended, we look at is uh, making sure that we have open space requirements in all of our subdivision ordinances which we do, we do as a county, um, making sure that the open space in the subdivision is appropriate so that it's not just a remnant lot that you stick somewhere because you can't do anything else with it, that the open space makes sense, that it's part of the migratory path, that there's forage in there and water for the wildlife, so, so we, and it's con contiguous, uh, would really, be the ideal thing so that it's really usable open space. Um, so we're looking at that. Um, I think we we are going to make a commitment to put on our development permits. Uh, we have all those disclaimers at the bottom of our permits. We'll add another one that says you are developing in big game habitat. Please be advised that wildlife may come through your yard or something along those lines. Um, looking at uh, we we have fence regulations, but not nothing like the cities. So maybe some changes to the fence regulations and heights, um, and then that those would be the big ones. But not to say outright just no more development, unless that's what the board wants to do. But I wouldn't foresee that. Okay, man. Yeah, well, yeah, especially on our. Uh, Density credits and stuff were down. Well, polo ranges went from five acres to acre lots, which created a huge open space, which was a 10 acre open space. And, you know, I'm all for doing that if we, we reduce the size of the lots to create more continuous open space. I, I probably wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Yeah, we should have done that on Dune Estates. It's a disaster. Yeah over there right now. That's another story. I didn't say that. Okay. Okay, so it sounds like you're pretty much on board with that. Um, so I just have these other two elements. Um, one of the things um, that I was going to mention is that um, many zones other than resource zones have um, wetlands and major and peripheral big game habitat um, and some of those are resources that are um, worthy of, of restoration or enhancement and there are a lot of owners out there who would like to undertake those projects but they're mentioned they're not mentioned in the zone that they're in um, and so an example would be my own uh, property which is um, uh, AF2 or not AF2 I have some AF um, agriculture forestry zoning but I also have some RA2 residential agriculture two acre minimum zoning and it's not mentioned in there for um, a, a project for if I wanted to do restoration um, in a couple places on it which I wouldn't mind doing uh, so I was 
thinking that maybe we could add some language that um, and it isn't something that would be required of people to do, but it would add language um, to goal five that would allow projects for restoration and enhancement of fish and wildlife habitat to be permitted as conditional as permitted and conditional uses in all zones if people wanted to undertake those projects. Not required to, but just if they wanted to. Except for Dan, you know, the Division of State Lands is probably going to have an issue with that. But I'm sure it can be done through lots of permits. But you, to put in something that you can just basically do it, it's going to be a conflict with the Division of State Lands on your fill removed and everything else. You mean like um, stream <laughs> habitat? Like, um, I mean, you can go in and remove um, like Himalaya blackberry now, for example, but um, I mean, a lot of the projects that people are undertaking are things like removing um, not, you know, invasive species. And so you're, but you're thinking about like filling or removal and, and changing of, of um, banks. I'm misunderstanding. I, I thought you meant enhancement by creating the ponds and and stuff like that, and you know, um, basically ponds is what I'm thinking. Of. Well, that's certainly, a big, that's a big no-no. Well, it could be that somebody would want to. I mean, I, I'm remembering a project that um, Crest undertook here in the last couple of years, where they did a bunch of habitat restoration. Um, down in um, like in, uh, toward the mouth of Mary's Creek and um, Nat Creek and um, Big Creek, Ferris Creek. Um, and so it did um, require joint application permitting, uh, but I thought it had quite a bit of support from the state. It was, it was um, something that increased floodplain capacity and um, actually did a lot of work for um, fish and wildlife habitat. So, uh as it turned out, the zones that they were working in did permit it, but um, I could see, especially in those areas, there's some other zones that don't permit it. So if people wanted to undertake those projects, it would be a different stretch. So we were just looking for something that would support landowners being able to do those kinds of projects. And I, I wouldn't have a problem at all. Maybe you should put some language with, with the blessings or permitting of the division of state lands, because it's yeah. definitely doable. But you know all the enhancements and the mitigations are all all doable, but they're a pretty good process. So yeah. Okay. It, yeah, it would just be something that would support it and make it um, a, just an easy development permit rather than um, having to conflict yeah. something. I think sure. that sounds great. Okay. Sure. I, um, I like that. I have a question for Jim. I just want to know, Jim, do you and Dan Carey exchange Christmas cards every year? <laughs> we're, we're, very, we're very, very close. Oh, I know you are. We love, we love to bander with each other. <laughs> I actually sort of like Dan in a weird, morbid way. <laughs> well, you must. You spend enough time with him. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't know, tell me. Okay, so I had one other thing for you to look at, and this was another staff recommendation. Um, and honestly, it's something that you've already addressed and I think you're already in support of, and that was just standards regarding yeah, yeah. riparian and stream setbacks um, that are ambiguous and not well-defined and using the, the state's language for the Forest Practices Act, and you've already agreed to that. So I'll just throw that out there for you. Other than that, that's really what I had for you this evening, and that's that's about it. That's awesome. You got through a lot of material really fast, guys. There's only two of well, Because we're opinionated. That's true, too. And cooperative. The more people, the more the debate there is, and the longer it takes. So when you only have two, it works out well. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I agree with everything. <laughs> A meeting should have no more than three people, but that's that's my take. All right, so we're at uh, public comment and input. This is the time for everybody who's interested in speaking to uh, say their piece. 
Who's got any comments? Lori? Carol? No public comment at this time. Uh, let's talk about uh, the review for the next meeting and date and time. What, what are we talking about? Early January? Well, you guys had been meeting on the third Thursday, as I recall. Okay. And I want to verify that that still works for you. It does. I do have a question. There's Lori. Yes. Yeah, um, I know we were trying to get some more representatives out on the board so that, you know, I mean, you guys are doing all the work right now and there's several spots open on the board. And I know people applied. What what happened to that plan? Yeah, the board did a work session and discussed uh, the applicants on November 4th and they'll be doing their appointments next Wednesday on December 9th at their uh, regular 6 p.m. meeting. Oh, okay. So they will be filling in slots. Not that these guys aren't doing a great job. I'm just, you know, it's like there's a lot yeah. of slots there. I'm just wondering why they are filled. Uh, be, well, part of it is the board only meets once in November and once in December, and they mm -hmm. have uh, started a new process where they like to review the applicants at a work session before they actually vote on them. Uh, so that's part of the slowdown. And then uh, we actually had uh, three applicants for the Lewis and Clark uh, committee, so we should be getting three new members. Okay, well, and thank you guys for hanging in there through this, you know, shortage. Yeah. And, and, and I misspoke, it's the fourth Thursday that you've been meeting. Right. So your next meeting, if you follow that continued schedule, would be January 28th. So, and you're meeting at 6 in the evening does that still work um do you want to, i mean i guess staff would recommend going ahead and setting the date for the next meeting knowing that you've got some other people coming on board and it might um be that you come up with a new meeting time when you end up with you know three new people it might be something needs to flex a little bit but do you want to at least set the next one for january 28th yeah i i think that's great let's keep it consistent um, okay. That way, it doesn't seem like we're making any special accommodations. We're just setting it, and people show up if they can. Okay. So, Jim, 6 p.m. on January 28th? Yep, that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, so, that's all that staff has for you. Great. Jim, any comments? Nope. Carol, Lori, any uh, final comments? All right, if not, I will draw this meeting on December 3rd, 2020 to adjournment. I don't know if that's even true, but uh, it's adjournment. Thank you. Thank you everybody very much.